Thanks, Lucy. Um, and uh, yeah, hello, everyone. Um, thanks to the Crafts Council for inviting me here today. And um, Maurizio, how on earth do you follow that? Um, but I'll, <laughs> I'll just tell you what we're doing. So, hmm. technical error? There we go. You okay? Um, okay, so I'm going to talk for 15 minutes about how maker culture can be a powerful driver for sustainability in our experience. So, tiny bit about me. I used to be a designer, interaction designer, and then I got more and more aware that products um, are no longer designed for product lifestyle, lifetime. They're not designed for longevity, they're not designed for fix and repair. And this kind of gradual awareness of being in the design industry that was kind of studiously ignoring the word sustainability uh, finally got to me. So I jumped ship, closed my design company, and I founded, co-founded the Great Recovery Project at the RSA, which was an amazing three-year project. Uh, yes, yeah, so we took people around the country to tin mines, waste sites, recycling centres, and it was super interesting. I mean, as someone who likes to understand how things were made, it was really interesting. And by taking people who normally worked these days in a computer in an office, by taking people to the rubbish dumps, to the recycling centres, they ch completely changed their mindset. They, we got people taking things apart. This is us taking... This is us taking a washing machine apart. Um, and in the process of taking things apart, we understood why they weren't designed for recycling, why they weren't designed with their life cycle in mind. Um, so that was a great project, but um, <clears throat> I, at the same time that we were doing that, at the same time that we were, we were looking, looking at what was going on, we saw the rise of maker spaces um, uh, so I can get distracted by technical issues. I won't look, and then I won't know whether it's not on or not. Um, uh, so yeah, we saw the rise of makerspaces, uh, of fix and repair, of um, uh, fab labs happening, and we thought um, we thought actually we want to take this further. We were doing one day trips to to these to these uh, recycling centres, um, and actually we then were. We then weren't taking it further. Although I must say that out of all the people, out of all the designers that we took uh, to various different rubbish dumps around around the country, um, there's a massive shift in how people designed after that. So people started designing for a circular economy, um, which is very very good to see. And also, just an observation was that the project was funded by the. Um, technology strategy board that became Innovate UK and we were not allowed to use the word sustainability or green or eco and I feel really strongly about that it's kind of it's kind of interesting that we're on a sustainability panel which I'm super interested in but actually why is that separate these days you know we, we're so far down the line as Lucy explained very eloquently in her introduction so this was really interesting it wasn't in the name of sustainability the actual drivers so for, because it was government money the drivers were about resource scarcity and resource efficiency so if you're caterpillar and you make massive great engines for your trucks and you're working with steel, if the price of steel is really volatile, you don't know what your forward uh, cash flow is going to be over the next few years. But if you lease your engine and you get it back at the end of its life, your business is much more stable. So it was really interesting, actually, not talking about sustainability, but just talking about good design and good business. So enough of that. I, I, um, so so I, I was kind of thinking, makerspaces, I want to I do more. I want to kind of, you know, actually get my hands dirty as opposed to just uh, helping other people get their hands dirty. So I am now um, director of, a, of Machines Room, which is an open access makerspace in East London. Um, we've got 4,000 square feet on the canal and we've got um, the usual range of makerspace fab lab machines. We've got a community of which is very focused on art and design. I, I always think that maker spaces are um, kind of the, the character of a maker space depends very much on who started it, who's running it, and where it is. So, with Machines Room, it was founded by Thomas Ermacora, who's an urban futurist and 
um, arch uh, uh, regeneration architect. So he's very much interested in participatory placemaking. Um, the people who run it are designers and artists, and it's in East London, which um, has got a very rich culture and heritage of making and manufacture, of which more in a minute. So the space and the machines are all very well, but the culture that we have provided there is really what I'm talking about today. Um, so makerspaces generally, you know, I'm sure we all know this, but makerspaces are, they're really a magnet for inventive people from all walks of life. Um, and for very disruptive outliers, people who like to think differently. So the last session we were hearing about Open Desk, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Open Desk. Um, and <coughs> so people who, who can think out, out of the box. Should we just turn it that way a bit? Um, and people who don't follow the rules, like this technology is not following the rules. Um, also, it's very much about values. For us, it's very much about values. It's creative, it's social, it's empowering, it's useful, and it's collaborative. The, the, the value in your contribution uh, to, the, to the community is not monetary. It's about sharing information, and it's about helping other people. So I think it's worth just thinking about why making is trending right now, why it's so, in, why it's so pertinent, um, and why people have a hunger for it. We have all sorts of people walking the doors. Like, you know, we have a lot of designers and artists, but then we have all sorts of people. And Matthew Crawford, in his book, The Case for Working With Your Hands, from a few years ago, he talks about technology making us passive and dependent and infantilized. And when he's talking about technology, he's really talking about screens. So, for instance, he gives the example of... Um, uh, a car engine. So in an old car, you have to remember to change the oil. You have to open the bonnet, you have to screw the cap off, you have to um, put the dipstick in, you have to look and see you know, how much oil there is. You get your hands dirty. You know. So brilliantly, I don't want to do that. Well, I do, but actually, because I'm a maker. But uh, normal people don't want to do that. They get their hands dirty. It's a pain in the ass. You have to remember it. So in new high-end cars now, uh, the car emails you when your oil needs changing. And then you take it to the garage to get it changed. So it's completely taken away from you. And we're making those decisions all the time. We're letting technology look after us, those tiny little things all the time. And so it makes us passive and dependent and infantilized. You know, he, Matthew Crawford says that this learned help, helplessness leaves us bereft of something that is the core of being human. Um, we've already talked about that quite a lot today. And that thing is individual agency. So the experience of seeing a direct effect of your actions in the world and knowing that these actions are genuinely your own is incredibly powerful. So when we're talking about sustainability, if you don't feel you have agency, if you don't feel you can change the world, then I don't think you can engage with the idea of sustainability, with the idea that uh, us making stuff is affecting the planet, that we're in this Anthropocene era. Um, so makerspaces and machines room really help foster this, this sense of individual agency. And we see it with the young people we train. So you see that they've spent their whole time being very disempowered. And actually, when they make things, especially if these things have a positive social or environmental impact, you see them kind of come to life. And that's what we want from the next generation. Obviously, we want people who are like, oh, all right, what can I do? Um, it's worth saying at this point that at Machines Room we have quite a, posit a positive social agenda as well, but we're only talking about um, the sustainability side today. So um, this is a footage, bit of footage from uh, a not working video of an exhibition we held in September. The exhibition was about all the work that's going on in our hyper-local area that's to do with um, positive social or envi environmental impact, and it was called Fix Our City. And... <clears throat> Actually, what we did was um, just show that Machines Room and the Make a Mile, which I'll explain in a minute, the area that we are, is uh, it's a test bed, and it's a test bed for us to move towards what's called the Fab City vision, which I'll explain as well. So, what is the Fab City vision? Um, it, it, it's a it's a vision of how cities can be better in the future. Um, and fab, for those who don't know, is a play on the word fabrication and fabulous. Um, 
which I really is nice, it's a good word. And the idea of a fab city is that in the future, in 2054, I think it is, so th the way a city works at the moment, if you had a diagram of a city, you'd have products going in and trash going out. So products, trash, products, trash. That's pretty much what happens. Um, and the idea of the, this kind of idyllic future city is that you have materials going in and data going in and then maker spaces and fab labs throughout the city are employed to make, fix, repair and keep those materials in flow for much longer and create a much more local economy. But with this data distributed, global data, and that's the big difference from um, going back to, to cottage industry or, or something that we had in the past. It's the data layer that changes things. <coughs> So Thomas Diaz, who's uh, one of the main instigators of, of fa uh, fa Fab City, says that cities are the greatest creation of humanity and at the same time they are our biggest challenge. So we're working on the principle that makerspaces can creatively mediate between the kind of sweeping agendas imposed on us from above and then the needs of the citizens. So we're trying to, to, to meet both those needs. <coughs> So by 2054, the idea of the Fab City is that cities will produce locally, actually produce within the city walls, at least 50% of what they consume. Also, there will be a global repository of open source designs for city solutions. So that's really crucial as well, the, the, the data sharing, the global sharing, so that everyone isn't reinventing the wheel all the time and everyone is working together to achieve the vision throughout the world. And the third point is um, that materials are sourced locally through recycling and digital materials. And these fab cities are going to harness the power of make spaces and the maker movement to help do this. And it's, it's gaining traction. You know, here's a map of the fab cities, the mayors of the fab cities who've actually signed up. So we've got... Um, Barcelona, Shenzhen, Amsterdam, Paris, Kingdom of Bhutan, Detroit. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's gaining traction and people are actually starting to think about how we might get to that point. There are 701 Fab Labs around the world and Machines Room is part of the Fab Lab network. So if each of those really embedded and followed the Fab City agenda within, th within those spaces, which they don't at the moment. But if there was more integration, then that would be an incredibly powerful force. So I'm now going to give a couple of examples of projects we're working on in Machines Room um, and what some of this looks like in practice. So just to, to talk a little bit about distributed manufacturing, um, <coughs> lovely term. We've talked about it a bit this afternoon already, so that's handy. But just to remind us, this is a 3D printer. I'm sure you've all seen them. Um, and they change the way we manufacture. So when we want something, we print it. it is, I still find it kind of magic. Um, Gareth, who I work with, uh, wanted a key for his gas cupboard. So he just moved house a couple of weeks ago. So he could have gone to a shop and, or online and bought a gas key, but he actually went onto Thingiverse and found a model of a gas key and printed it. Um, so that's an example of, of, of distributed manufacturing. Um, this is a tiny example, now we're going to go to a bigger example. So makerspaces like Machines Room are democratising the means of production. We can now compete with industrial products in a disruptive way. Um, and we in can involve citizens, more importantly, in the process of manufacture. So here's a quote from Chris Anderson, founder of TED. He says, since the first industrial revolution, the power to make things at scale has belonged to those who own the means of production, which has meant big factories, big companies, and the mass-marketed goods they were made for. But the same was true for mass media in the 20th century, and we've seen what the internet and its long tail of content has done to that. So now imagine a long tail of things, physical goods created with the web's digital innovation model. That's the maker movement. So... Machines Room is based in the Maker Mile, which is a one-mile radius of over 50 traditional light industrial workshops, new fabrication workshops, maker spaces, studios. It's full of architects, artists, old-fashioned manufacturers. It's got a really old foundry, it's got an umbre umbrella factory, um, and it's got all the young tech startups and, and people like us, maker spaces and studios. <coughs> 
earlier today, we heard about Open Desk. So Open Desk are in our street, and I'm going to tell you a slightly different angle on the Open Desk story. So from a sustainability point of view, um, Open Desk is actually it's a really good exemplar of Fab City principles of the circular economy principles because rather than shipping tables and chairs around the world you sh ship the data like I was saying with the Fab City in and out you you ship the data but then you're making locally like Indy said earlier within seven miles on average of, of where the customer is so where they're making partners they they um, prototype a lot of things with us as well so we really understand how it all works um, so instead of large factories there's lots of tiny ones like Indy said earlier um, and it's just like 3D printing, except bigger. So this is a picture of our CNC um, router at work. It takes a full sheet of ply, and um, that's Gerard cutting a table out of there. So the example, where, so where I think this is really, really, uh, goes back to my sense of my, my talking about um, agency and how making changes, changes what, how we feel about the world. So a couple of months ago, a woman emailed us and she said, um, hi, Machines Room, can I have three open desk stools and a lamp, please? Can you give me a quote? So we quoted her and we said, sure, okay, so we'll make you this furniture. Do you want to come in and watch? So she's like, yeah, I'll come in and watch. So she lived a couple of miles down the road and we managed to, to fit her three stools and her lamp on one sheet of ply. And she came in, she watched. We got her involved in the making, so once it had been actually cut, there's still quite a lot of intensive work to be done after that. You've got to sand and you've got to oil and you've got to finish it, so we got her involved in all of that. And the process, so the process for Mark, who was, who was actually making the furniture, and for the woman who was the customer, the process is extremely different from going to Ikea. The price point isn't that different. The price point is maybe 20% more than going to Ikea. She could have bought plywood furniture from Ikea, but if you buy from Ikea, you um, you don't really value that object. You know, if your stool breaks, you just chuck it, or you know, you don't really care about it. But I see again and again that when people are involved in making something, they completely because they understand how it's made and they have an emotional attachment to it. They will never chuck that stool away, or not until the last possible minute. You know, they'll give it to someone or they'll bring it back and ask us to fix it if something happens to it. And I think that's really, really. Um, really powerful and also from Mark's point of view who's making the furniture compared to him working in a factory somewhere it's also very different because actually there's a lot of skill in making open desk furniture to make it well and he gets to meet the client and actually have a dialogue about any changes they particularly want as well so there's something that's going on there that's really interesting um, there's a few images Putting it together is often a group exercise that looks like a twister or something. Um, but I think uh, what's really interesting as well is we, ha we also have a, a knitting machine that people are making in Machines Room as well. And it's, um, it's different from the one that's in the Cross Cancer magazine. It's a slightly different um, idea. But again, this, when, when this knitting machine, which is called Knitterate, when it's up and running, um, you'll be able to go to your local makerspace and essentially 3D print a knitted garment. So in terms of what Lucy was talking earlier about the amount of waste in the fashion industry, you know, that completely changes supply chains. But, you know, so all, the, all these, all these um, so Open Desk and the knitting one and things like Local Motors who are 3D printing cars in the States, everyone's changing business models and changing supply chains. And from a sustainability point of view, um, it's about materials and supply chains, but it's also about the human relationship to something that has been made on your doorstep. So that all sounds great, doesn't it? But there's a problem. So the problem is that we have a massive plywood waste problem. So Open Desk makes these lovely things, and then you've got all these little bits of plywood left over. It's quite a big bit of plywood left over. Um, and we really looked into how to dispose of this, and that we're working really closely with Open Desk on this as well to try and improve how we nest everything and how we put it on the sheet. But there's still a lot of um, there's still a lot of waste. So yeah, and it costs us yeah 100 pounds a week just to get rid of it. Um, and we don't like the idea of it going off and being burnt somewhere. 
So we're exploring possibilities of what to do this. If anyone has any ideas, we're very, very um, interested. So we've been using our Makers in Residence. We have, so part of our culture is that we have a really strong Makers in Residence program. And the Makers in Residence are chosen on their um, interest in making positive social or, in, or social or environmental impact. So one of our makers in the summer was a guy called Peter A. Smith, and he laminated loads of sheets of plywood together and then made some very, very beautiful turned bowls from it, which were part of our Fix Our City exhibition, and um, they, he sold the whole lot. It was really great. We also, some of our makers um, called, some of our members called Plyset, are making a lamp which is um, the shade is made from 90% recycled um, 3D printer filament and uh, the actual rest of the lamp was all made from uh, plywood scraps. And they're really exploring a kind of nomadic manufacturing, so, so only making, making little pop-up factories in maker spaces around the country that change... Um, what they make and what they design, depending very much on their hyper-local area. So last but not least, um, the last project I'm going to talk about is about our hyper-local recycling centre that we've just built. So um, as I've said, we've got waste issues and plastic is a really big issue for us. So we decided to see just how hard it would be to recycle plastic. Our starting point was the Dave Hacken's uh, Precious Plastic Open Source Project. So again, an uh, a really good idea, a really good example of how data, freely shared data, can be a really good starting point for other people's ideas. So <clears throat> we built on that. Um, we've built a shredder and we've built, we've repurposed a plastic extruder. Um, and we've repurposed our t-shirt presses into plastic melting machines. And we're working on uh, collecting plastic milk bottles from local cafes, washing, cutting, shredding, and then melting. We're making coasters to go back into the coffee shop. Um, and our next goal is to make sheet material to go on the CNC machine. Uh, so wouldn't it be great if next time someone comes and gets some stools cut, uh, they make it from, we make it from recycled plastic. So that's an example of um, something from our uh, in injection molder, a button made from 100% recycled milk bottles, which we're very happy with. Um, so what this project does is it really brings together a community. So I think that people, again, feel very disempowered. This, our recycling rates for plastic, uh, domestic recycling rates, are still 30-something percent. I mean, they're pathetic. Most people still put their milk bottles in the black bin. So... This is a way of people, and we've got all sorts of people. We've got 18-year-old school leavers, retired engineers, designers, artists, lots of people involved in the making of this project. Um, Craig, who talked earlier, came over from South Africa for a month and built our shredder magnificently. And people have been really generous and interested in building all this, all this um, equipment, which we're, we're now going to be making products with. Um, and it definitely gives people a sense of agency and a sense of, oh, maybe I can understand material flow. So from a community point of view, um, it really works. So I'm going to end here. I've just noticed the time. Um, so th this is a failed button. These are the eyes there are buttons, but then the rest of it just splurged out, but I quite like, quite like it. Um, so just to sum up, we're on our way uh, to making Machines Room and the Maker Mile a prototype fab city using hands-on making and using digital fabrication infrastructure to address local solutions while being collected to uh, global networks. And we're doing this in a distributed and non-hierarchical manner, which is bringing access to tools to, many, to as many people as we can. So we believe that it's a major opportunity to enable the development of a positive, more um, sustainable future city. So I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you.